Um, I'm so uh, honored that you're here today, and um, we are looking forward to um, really learning together here in the next several weeks in a brand new series. And um, can you see me okay? I have a hard time seeing you, but can you see me okay? Good, good, good. I don't need to see you. You need to see me, but I don't need to see you. Um, so, over at Costco, things are happening. Really good things are happening. By the way, I saw this morning, uh, one of my family members sent us a meme that there, that there was a couple who got married in Costco, wearing Kirkland's signature outfit. And I thought to myself, what a great reception idea, hot dog combos for everybody. I mean, what a great idea. Um, anyway, I was, I was, I'm, I'm always astonished by the long lines at the gas station over at Costco. And um, they move pretty quick, but those, those lines are long. And it has occurred to me over the past several months that the only thing longer than the lines at Costco gas station is the lines, you may already know this, are the lines to get in to see a Christian counselor. From what I've been hearing, uh, in my sources and references, um, Christian counselors are still booked months and months in advance to help we humans deal with what has been happening in our world the last couple of years, along with and on top of what everybody's been dealing with before that, right? So it's this compounded fracture that's happening. And, and I don't know about you, but I still sense in people that this past couple of years has been long, and there's a sense of weariness that has set in, physically tired, emotionally tired, months full of pain and loss and uncertainty. And for the most part, it's drained people. It's drained us, human beings. And we long for this season's um, um, personal and public strength and bounce back. And really, we've seen the fear and the frustration and the fighting. We just long for that to end both personally and publicly and to once and for all see more justice and more peace and certainly see more truth that prevails in our culture. And I would, and I would make an observation that our souls tend to be collectively weary and aching for some rest. You may sense that personally. You may sense that for what's happening publicly. And, and I'm so happy to tell you that the book of Ruth is perfect for this moment. The book of Ruth... Um, shows us where we can find, even in the midst of today's turmoil, it shows us where we can find rest for our weary souls. And there's a list. I mean, if we started to talk about the reasons people are weary, we could really, um, I think, uh, take a long time doing that. But through the book of Ruth, we're going to see together that God has provided for us deep rest for our weary, weary souls. I don't mean like a Sunday nap rest for our souls which is nice. I mean a thoroughly therapeutic health, a leap forward in the, in the health of our soul. And the book of Ruth is going to invite us to reflect on an important question, and it's this. How is God involved in the day-to-day -day joys and hardships of our lives? And the book of Ruth is going to walk us through how is He involved? And it's going to answer the question, is he involved? And it's going to answer the question, how is he involved in our day-to-day -day lives? And um, it's so important for us when you think about how he's involved, because a lot of us aren't sure how he's involved. There are some people you talk to, and when you hear them speak, you realize they believe that God is literally steering them minute by minute. Other people, I think, um, probably believe that God is occasionally sending us signs and signals. And in some ways, it's our job to decode those signs and signals. And yet other people say, you know, I'd be happy just to see God maybe um, doing something uh, because it appears to me like He may not even see what's going on in the world. And... The answer that we're going to learn together 
What we're going to see as we walk through this book together is this, that God rules over His hurting people. Even if His hand is normally hidden, He's ruling over His people. We're going to be reminded of that. We're going to see how that works. And I'll give you a little interesting factoid. That's a great word. Isn't that a great word? i got to use that more. Remind me to use that word. Here's a little factoid. The name God doesn't show up in the book of Ruth, but the hand of God shows up in every page, every chapter, in every verse, we see him alive and well. And the book of Ruth is going to illustrate for us how God works through ordinary people. When you would expect that God was going to be working in Israel through kings, and when you would expect that God was going to be working through Israel in, in, in all the judges that are overseeing the, the, the people of Israel, instead, he is working through the everyday faithfulness of ordinary people. And for those of you that are open to God working through you, this is a great book of the Bible because you start to accept the fact that God isn't only ever working through pastors and missionaries or kings and queens and rulers of countries, but He's working in the everyday ordinary people and His hand is present and active through just regular folks, just like you and me. In the book of Ruth, the faithfulness of God not only benefits the main character, and her mother-in-law, Naomi. But also the faithfulness of God eventually brings the ultimate king and healer that all of God's people need. Eventually, God goes on to bless the world through the faithfulness of Naomi and Ruth. God goes on uh, through the fam- to, to, to bring through the family of Naomi and Ruth the family of David, and then through the family of David, eventually we get to who? We get to the Messiah that the whole world will need. So, the beginning of Ruth, uh, we're going to talk about how God's hidden hand is in the book of Ruth, and we can see that hand, and we can trust that hand, and it starts in the period of time that judges ruled over Israel. And Ruth opens in a period that's marked by the absence of a king. God wants them to have a king, they don't want a king. So now they've got judges ruling over their land, and there's a general disobedience to the law of God among the people of God. They are in rebellion. They are living disobediently. Everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes. But Ruth's story is going to show us how God uses the courage of two women, two beautiful souls, even a non-Israelite woman, to give Israel their future king. And he's going to make that happen And this is the king that they always need, and he's going to make that happen through this Israelite couple. Elimelech um, and Naomi, they're a couple in in Israel, and there's a famine that hits Israel, and they flee. Uh, We're we're kind of, it indicates that the famine that's hit Israel is, is, is there's a really good... um, idea we have that God is disciplining Israel and there's this famine and and Elimelech and Naomi escape the famine by leaving and emigrating to Moab. Moab. Um, Even though the Israelites had been warned, no Moab. Stay away from Moab. When you get to Moab, the same thing happens. You start to associate with them, and before you know it, their daughters are marrying their sons. Your sons are marrying their daughters. And then eventually, it leads to worshiping gods. That's why we don't want our kids moving over to Salve. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I don't know anything about Salve. I had an English teacher that always picked on Salve. It just reminds me of that. In fact, you know what he said? This is kind of funny. Just, can we take a break for a second? Can we take a break for a second? I had an English teacher, 10th grade, Liverpool High School, who used to tell the creation story to set up some of this literature. And he said, and of course, everybody knows Adam and Eve rebelled against God and they did this terrible disobedience. And God, like you would expect him to, he threw them out of the garden all the way, and he draws an arrow to solve it. (laughs) I was like... That's actually pretty funny. That's pretty funny. I've never, it's literally the only thing that I remember from 10th grade English. <laughs> Completely untrue. So we're not in Solvay, though. I love Solvay. I lived in Solvay. It's close to my heart. 
We drive by Solvay. We live near Solvay to this day. Solvay powers the state fair, right? So we love Solvay. Um, we don't love Moab. God has, um, God has told His people, no Moab, and where does Elimelech and Naomi go? They move to Moab, Moab to escape this, um, this famine. And in Moab, Naomi's sons marry Moabites. So Naomi has um, two daughter-in-laws, Orpah and Ruth. Now, um, here's a disclaimer. I have read this name, Orpah, over and over and over again. Would you give me a pass if I say Oprah? Would you give me a pass? Would you? You're not going to give me a pass. I have to say Orpah? Oh, my gosh. Some of you give me a pass, though, right? <laughs> FYI, in the Bible, it's not Oprah. It is Orpah. Orpah and Ruth are the daughter-in-law. So, here's a little fast-forward story. At the beginning of the story, uh, Elimelech dies. Naomi's husband and her sons pass away. And so she's in Moab, and she finds herself alone. She's in a foreign land with her daughters-in-law. What will Naomi and her daughter-in-laws do next? How are they going to face being in a foreign land without husbands? An unmarried or widowed woman in that society, as you can imagine, was very vulnerable, especially economically, they're vulnerable. And Ruth and Orpah were young enough to pursue another marriage. But Naomi would have had literally no way to provide for, help, for herself if she would have stayed in Moab. So hearing that the famine is over in Israel, um, Naomi decides that she's going to turn back and she's going to go home. And she decides that she's going to do that by herself. And she tells her daughter-in-laws, and she says to her daughter-in-laws, daughter -in -laws, you stay here, you can start again. You're young, you can marry again, you can have a thriving, successful, flourishing life here uh, but I'm, I'm going to go back to Israel, and it's here in Israel through the lives of our main characters. Let me remind you real quick. Here's our main characters, just to get an overview of the story. We've got Naomi, who's the widow. We've got Ruth, who is the Moabite daughter-in-law. And we have Boaz. Obviously, Ruth here is who the book is named after. And then eventually, we're going to meet Boaz. And through these three people, we see two conflicting truths start to emerge in the Scriptures. And these are two conflicting truths that most of us as humans experience together. And these two truths are in tension with one another. And here they are. The book of Ruth holds in tension two seemingly opposite truths that we face, most of us, in our human lives. And that is these two truths. We experience pain. And also, we know that God is providing. Our pain and God's providence in tension with one another, right? If God was providing, why are we in pain? And if we're in pain, why isn't God providing? Why isn't He bringing relief? And those two things. And here's really one way, another way to say it is this. These two um, tensions, this tension between these two opposite truths are happening. We hurt and God helps. Well, if we're hurting, why isn't God helping? And if God was helping, certainly we wouldn't be hurting. So how is it possible that these two things are and, and by the way, people who are critical of the Christian faith with some real serious doubts about the Christian faith, this is one of the main tensions that they point out. Oh, all you people that have faith in God, you have faith in a God who never even helps you. Yes, He does. No, He doesn't because you're hurting. And we're hurting. And people hurt. And the children of God hurt. And therefore, uh, obviously, these are two seemingly opposite truths. So, Naomi, she returns to, to um, Moab and she is empty. And hurting. And then Naomi sees and senses while she's there that God has involved himself. His helping hand is showing up in her affliction. So let's look closer at Naomi, Naomi's pain. Naomi's a widow. She has suffered severe loss. She didn't just lose her husband, she lost her um, sons. She has lost her wealth. She has uh, literally now facing destitution, and she's stranded in a foreign and forbidden land. Or, as it's described in the book of Ruth, Naomi is experiencing this empty bitterness. 
And look how she describes her unexpected situation. She did not expect this to happen to her, and look how she describes it. Naomi says, things are far more bitter for me than they are for you. She's talking to her daughter-in-law here. Because the Lord himself has raised his fist against me. So Naomi starting to describe how much she hurts. And in her view, there's a fist that has come up against her, and it belongs to God, the God who's supposed to be helping her. How did Naomi describe what's happened to her? If you look at a couple of the verses, 20 and 21, Naomi says her life has become bitter. And she literally uses names to describe her experience in Moab, right? Can you imagine? She is describing her experience in Moab by the way she names her sons. And one of her her sons, she names the name that means sickly. Another one she names... I wish I didn't... Another one she names... (laughs) And the the son's name is failing. (laughs) This isn't funny. This is not a part that is supposed to be funny. But I'm like, can you imagine her sons are just curious one day? I wonder what my name means. You know, my next door neighbor, my friend, you know, his name means brave warrior. I wonder what my name means. Sickly? What? Failing? Huh? I mean, seriously, kids, never look up the name, the meaning of your name. You just never know. Raquel and I were thinking of naming our first child. We picked out a name. We had one name that we liked, which was Kayla. And depending on how you spell it, it meant... Goddess of war and destruction, right? All right, next, next name. Let's, uh, let's get on to something different. So Naomi's ma- name means pleasant. That's what her name means. But now she's changing her name. She wants to change her name from pleasant to be more reflective of what she's experienced. And she says, don't call me Naomi anymore. She responded, instead, call me Mara, because, for the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. Mara meaning bitter. So she's using names to describe her experience and how she is now grieving as a widow and her hopelessness in her economic destitution that she is facing. She said, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me? When I got to these words this week, the Lord has brought me home empty. I couldn't help but think of this experience that my wife and I had when we um, lost our unborn twins. And we went into the hospital pregnant. We were rushed in. We had an uh, emergency trip to the hospital. We, We went in and Raquel's full of life and hope and new joy. And, and then it seemed like minutes later we were on our way out of the hospital and I'm rolling her out of the hospital, sitting in a wheelchair, and there's no more children in the womb, no more babies in the womb. There's a potted plant in her lap. In her lap. And when I read these words, the Lord brought me home empty, I thought, that was the feeling. That was the weight. That was the sensation. That we were on our way home. When we got there, we were full of life and hope and expectancy and, and anticipation and joy that was coming. And then we leave home and literally feel like we've been emptied out. The joy has been emptied out. Hopes and dreams for our new babies, gone. So where was this God who helps? Do we really believe that this God of ours, this God of Ruth, this God of Naomi, do we really believe that this God can be trusted? When you read these words here, I wonder if you'd take a second and let them sit in, let let them sink in, and just sit with them for a second. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. And you think about here that Naomi's suffering is revealing what she believes about God. I mean, it's it's obvious, right? Who does God, who does Naomi blame for her, her suffering? She's not blaming the Moabites. She's not blaming sin and sickness and disease. She literally says, the Lord brought me home empty. She literally says, the Lord raised his fist against me. She literally says, the Lord caused me to suffer. She literally says, the Lord sent such tragedy upon me. And now, when she, she's, we're not sure if she believes this is just discipline for her or if it's unjust affliction. We're not sure. 
And we're also not sure that when she says her name is bitter, does she mean her circumstances are bitter or is she saying my heart is bitter? We're not quite sure. But we know who she sees and blames as the source of her grief and her loss and her emptiness. We know that she sees that God has brought that to her. So, was she right to do this? Does she recognize that God is a God of justice? who is disciplining the Israelites for their disobedience, or or maybe he's disciplining her for her disobedience and fleeing Israel and running to Moab? Does she recognize that maybe God is actually judging with justice when she's attributing her misfortune to God's hand? Is she accepting her own responsibility? And this is the thing, right? How many times do we end up making terrible decisions that leads to chaos and confusion in our lives and we're like, God, why did you do this to me? I counted on you, I'm looking for you, and I don't understand how it's possible that you've stranded me here. And all the way back at the beginning, God had been prompting us, don't do your own thing. Don't leave my safe, permissive boundaries for your life. Don't walk out from under my authority and live for your own glories and self-reliance and do your own thing. And now those consequences that you're carrying and facing in your life, we turn back and throw them in God's face. And I imagine this loving Father in heaven saying, those consequences were brought on by your own rebellion, your own disobedience, your own self-reliance and ignorance. And sometimes the pain in our lives is not God's discipline. It's not an affliction. It's not God raising his fist against me. This is just a side note. Sometimes it's the consequences for our own boneheaded selfish decisions and choices. We want to do our own thing for as long as possible. And then you've heard this phrase, right? You hit rock bottom. And what happens at rock bottom? Rock bottom, you're like, you know what? I'm sick and tired. But I'm actually sick and tired now of being sick and tired. I'm so far down, I can't possibly go any lower. I've lost everything. I might as well turn back to God. i got nothing nothing left to hope in or nothing left to try. Sometimes that's what we see. And obviously there's more to the story. This story's going to continue. Are we going to see a happy ending? Is there going to be, possibly at the end, maybe there's a great reversal at the end of the story? What are we going to see while we're looking into Naomi's story together? What are we going to discover in this book that brings so much hope and joy? God is also working behind her painful misfortune. Even though she is now empty and bitter, here's what we learn in the book of Ruth, that behind the scenes, unseen, without being noticed by Naomi and by Ruth, we are seeing that God is at work and He's at work right behind her painful misfortune. God's hidden hand of loving kindness is at work. His hidden hand. This is a great word, right? Um, I know I asked you if I could bring back factoid. I'm going to replace it. Let's bring back loving kindness. This is a Bible word. It's a God word. This is a word that we need in our lives because of how much we depend on God's loving kindness. And God uses a person, her daughter-in-law no less, to express, to demonstrate His faithful loving kindness to her. Through Ruth and ultimately through Boaz and in her bitter and empty condition, Naomi decides I'm going to go back to Israel, and I'm going to go back alone. And he tells, his, tells her daughter-in-laws, I'm going to go back alone. You both stay here, and it, 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 it might be possible for you to rebuild a life here, but I'm going to rebuild my life in Israel. And she says, and again, they wept together, saying goodbye. And Orpah, see why? See that word? See why? See what I mean? Say Orpah. Did your mind want to say Oprah? Good, some of you. <laughs> there's, some, there's a little bit of Oprah tension in the room. A little bit. God loves her. <laughs> so, so Oprah, ki- just kidding, just kidding. I'm just kidding. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but we've got the character in the story who is the famous one that we all know about that gets a a book named after her, but Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. And I can't wait to get to this part of the story, so I'm going to tell you now. I'm going to tell you now. 
I want you to grab a hold of those words clung tightly. And the reason why I want you to grab a hold of these words is because God is at work expressing himself in the life of Ruth. And God himself, through Ruth, is clinging tightly to Naomi. You see and you read Ruth, but when you step back and see the way that God is working his loving kindness into the life of Naomi, you you won't see Ruth anymore. You're only going to see the loving kindness clinging tightly to Naomi. Naomi, you're going to go back to Israel, but you're not going to go back empty and you're not going to go back alone. Why? Because Ruth is on fire. And Ruth is on fire clinging tightly to Naomi. Can you imagine what going back to Israel with Naomi meant for Ruth? Naomi wants to protect her from continued bereavement and widowhood in Moab, uh, in Israel. she She wants to protect her, the Moabite, from coming back to Israel and facing prejudice against immigrants. Naomi's trying to protect her from her vulnerability to the violence through this, um, this culture, the dependence that she'll need on charity, the responsibility of caring for her embittered mother-in-law. And Naomi saying, you don't have to do that, but Ruth, something's happening in Ruth. How does Ruth show this covenant love of the Lord in her attitude to Naomi? She shows her loving kindness. Look, Naomi says to her, your sister-in-law has already gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same. But Ruth shows loving kindness. She shows her love. She expresses her loyalty to Naomi. And she does so at great cost to herself. Just as God shows his love and shows his loyalty, just as God clings tightly to you and me at the cost of his own son. People say, well, the gift of salvation, it's a free gift. Well, it's free to you. It's not free to the Father in heaven who paid with his own son, who clings tightly in his loving kindness. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you. Right? Ruth is the daughter-in-law to Naomi. Don't ask me to leave you and turn back. There's a great line again. I mean, I'm, I am getting ahead of myself, but I'm, I just, listen to these words and let them come alive in your heart as the words from God through Ruth to anybody whose heart is hurting. Wherever you go, I'll go. Wherever you live, I'll live. I'll be there. I'm going to dwell with you. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. God is at work in the heart of Ruth. She is turning her back on the Moabites and saying, I want to belong to God's people. I want to live where God's people live. I want to be buried where God's people are buried. Why? Because I sense that he owns my heart and I belong to him. And I am clinging tightly to you. She goes on, wherever you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. This is amazing. Do you know what Ruth should be doing? She should be partnering up with Orpah on their way back to build their lives, rebuild their lives, not facing what she's going to be facing in Israel. And there are several signals in these verses that through her relationship with Naomi, God was clearly at work in the heart of Ruth. And Ruth had come to that place where she had wanted to belong to God and belong to God's people. In chapter 2, the fortunes of Naomi and Ruth really begin to change. In chapter 2, at first, the, the writer doesn't explicitly tell us that God's at work, but we have an advantage because of we get a chance to look back and read what we believe to be or what they believe to be these coincidences. Somehow, one thing led to another, and then somehow that thing led to another thing, and we're invited to detect the hidden hand of God. We are invited to see it, to see God's hand at work, working to bring healing to a hurting heart. And to care for her mother-in-law, Ruth goes out gleaning. This is something that 
people would do where the farmers and the harvesters would, would uh, harvest a crop and then whatever kind of falls by the wayside, some people would go out and they would glean. They would basically just pick up the leftovers after a harvest. And Ruth is out gleaning later on here in chapter, in, in chapter 2 and um, picking those things up. And here we see so vividly, now we're going to see so vividly that God's hidden hand of provision is at work. And provision, of course, you may or may not know this, but provision means that your needs are provided for. Um, your needs are met. So God's hidden hand is meeting needs, is providing for those needs. So here we go. Where did you gather all this grain today, Naomi asks? Where did you work? May the Lord bless the one who helped you. May the Lord bless whoever is helping you and allowing you to glean the harvest in their field. That doesn't belong to us, it belongs to them. And she's pretty excited. And in chapter 2, verse 20, Naomi starts to sense and she starts to possibly see that God's at work by His hand of providence doing something to meet her needs. So Ruth tells her mother-in-law about the man in whose field she had worked. And she said, the man I worked with today, his name is Boaz. And Naomi recognizes that name. And she says, may the Lord bless him. Naomi told her daughter-in-law, he is showing his kindness to us as well as to your dead husband. Kindness here means covenant love. God Himself, through Boaz, is expressing, He's meeting our needs. His, again, His kindness is being expressed to us. The Lord is the one who is providing for His people because He is faithful to continue on with His covenant promises. And Naomi's starting to see that God is, seems like He's doing something to provide for us. How is He providing His kindness to them? Um, it's so so important for us to grasp this word kindness. This um, Ruth is permitted to glean in the fields of Boaz. Boaz gives her permission. He's a man of noble character. He's a man of abundant generosity. It turns out that Boaz is hospitable. He's kind. He starts to demonstrate his protective care over her, and he even prays that God would bless them. And like every good infomercial, but wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. That man is one of our closest relatives. You've got to be kidding me. You just said Boaz? Boaz is one of our closest relatives. Turns out he's one of our family redeemers. If you have a version of the Bible uh, that is a more traditional version of the Bible, more literal, you would see the phrase kinsman redeemer. What does that mean? Well, there was a law. And there was a law that required the brother of a deceased man to marry his widow and then raise up a son and in, in so doing protect the family name, protect the family wealth, and also, also protect the family. Kinsman redeemer. Husband dies, the brother marries the wife and protects her, his, the, the brother's name, property, and the people that loved him in his family. And though Boaz was not a brother to Ruth's deceased husband, he was a close relative to the family. He was close enough. And he could, he had the power. It was, there was potential for him to act as a redeemer to um, rescue them out of their coming poverty. And Naomi sensed the willingness of Boaz. Then Ruth said, what's more, Boaz even told me to come back and stay with the harvesters until the entire harvest is complete. Good, Naomi exclaimed. Do as he said, my daughter. Stay with his young women right through the whole harvest. You might be harassed in other fields, but with him, you will be safe. You'll be safe with him. Now let's slow down and focus, if we could. Um, just for a minute. Can we just slow down and focus? I want you to see something. But you'll be safe with him. You'll be safe with him. Again, just like Naomi, just like Ruth, will be safe with God, who is faithful to keep 
and follow through on His covenant promises, who is faithful in His loving kindness, who is faithful in His providence. Just like God, Boaz is giving to Ruth even beyond what the law demanded. Boaz is given above and beyond. And we see and we trust the faithful, loving kindness of God's covenant promises expressed here. But you'll be safe with Him. This is an answer to their prayer. This is clearly God at work. Can you picture God as described in chapter 2, verses, 21, uh, verses 12 and 20? This is how God's described in the book of Ruth. May the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings have come to take refuge, may, those, may He re- reward you fully for what you have done. God is the one who gives refuge. And by the way, if you don't somehow, have you, if you have not yet come to picture God as, I mean, you can almost picture him like, it pains me to say this because of my relationship with birds, but it, picture God like a mother bird and with wings bringing shade and rest and refuge, covering her chicks with her wing. It's a theological term for God's providence that he has you covered. You are safe with Him. God is the, uh, um, He is the supremely capable provider to bring covering. Sometimes it's shade, sometimes it's protection, sometimes it's provision. It's always loving kindness. And hurting hearts can picture hidden hands at work. God rules over His people, and even if His actions are often hidden from us, we should picture this these wings that bring shelter and rest. And in Boaz and Ruth, we see how God demonstrated His loving kindness. We see how He's demonstrated His provision through His own people. So how do you find rest? How do you find rest? Right? I, I, I don't, I'm not thrilled with the idea that when we read the Old Testament, we, we read ourselves into the narrative all the time. That's not a, 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 an accurate way or a, the best way to interpret the Old Testament. But I can tell you this, in the book of Ruth, you can see yourself, you can see God providing for you the way that He's provided for Ruth. The book of Ruth may not tell us something about you, but it tells you something about the God that you serve. How do we find rest? If your health has been failing, it's quite possible that um, you continue to face a fearful reaction to the culture and the craziness and the chaos that's going on in the world. It's still very possible that you may have faltering energy to continue to give your own kids what they need, what they're demanding, to give your employer what they're demanding. It's possible that you have um, a marriage that is continuing to stir up frustration It's also very likely that some of you are just having such a hard time waiting for your spouse to come to saving faith, to respond to the beautiful loving kindness of Jesus. And you're not quite sure, how long can I hold on? How long can I hang on? I'm so anxious I'm so worried. I've grown so weary in trying to figure out how this is going to work out. Here's what I want to share with you today based on the book of Ruth. Don't miss. Please don't miss the way God's loving you through people. Please don't miss the people that God has brought into your life and has brought close to you who is communicating His loving kindness and provision through ordinary means, right? Most of us, I think, if you've been around uh, um, the Bible long enough, and especially if you have a Pentecostal heritage, oftentimes we think, God, we need you. God, I'm looking for you, and I'm pretty confident it's going to be a burning bush. I'm ready. I've got faith. Pow, let it happen. And it's quite possible that God sends a burning bush It's quite possible. Oftentimes, he does, and every time, he's able to. 
Much of the time, he doesn't go, pow, burning bush. Much of the time, he says, look around you. Look around at the people I put in your life. Look around at the people that I have lovingly connected you with because I have a hand and this hand is now hidden in your life, but it's come through the people who love you most and are making sacrifices to be near you because I have loving kindness for you and I see you in your empty bitterness, but I'm present near you. And I didn't come close with a pow burning bush, but I am ever present with calls and texts and love, and hugs, and presence, and warmth, and compassion, and my loving kindness is coming through just ordinary people. That's how God works. That's also how God works. Look for those people. It might be a parent, or a doctor, or it might be uh, a neighbor, or a boss, or an employee, or a teammate, or a co-worker. It might be a classmate. It might be someone you least expect that God's at work. So many times people tell me, when I needed it, someone from my extended church family connected with me and cared for me. I I hear this all the time. Pastor Rich is here. Pastor Rich, I hear this all the time. I was like, God, I need someone, something, Pastor Rich. Present. Pastor Rich, I'm thrilled that you don't primarily represent this church family In my pastoral leadership, you represent the loving kindness of our Father in heaven who's present in the lives of people, faithfully present. See those people, whoever they are. See them. Pray for them. Thank God for sending them. Also, remember that if or when God disciplines you, who does God discipline? Bible people, who does God discipline? Those who He loves. If you are not getting disciplined by God, You know why that's not possible? Because God is love. And since God is love, He is loving you. What does that love look like? Does it look like hearts, good vibes? Does it look like warm fuzzies? Does it look like goosebumps? Does it look like this song? I mean... These are good tears. I mean, maybe that's what it looks like, but I want you to see a God of the Bible, and a God of the Bible disciplines His children. Why? Because He says, you have left my care. Now you are on your own doing your thing, living for your glory by your self-righteousness and your self-reliance, and there's bad news at the end of that path, and I need you for your sake to come back under my authority and to make that happen. I ain't scared of dropping a little discipline in your life. And, 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 and listen, we're going to pray here in a few minutes together as a church family, and oftentimes we're like, God... This is my prayer. Take it away. And I wonder if we listen close enough, we hear the Holy Spirit saying, I'm not taking it away. I sent it to you. I be the one who sent that to you. You sent pain to me? Yes, because I am a God who loves you. And when I love you, I discipline you. And I'm not sending this pain to hurt you. I'm sending this pain to remind you outside of my authority is nothing but death and hurt and suffering and hopelessness and empty bitterness. But when you come under my covering, you're going to see and you're going to sense that my hidden hand is at work and my hidden hand is at work providing you all the loving kindness and provision that you need. God always sends exactly what you need to flourish even while you're being disciplined. And we could see this in the life of David, right? If we did a series on the life of David, you would see David has done some bonkers, rebellious things. And every time he does, God is right there clinging to him tightly. He doesn't abandon him. He's clinging to him tightly. But it's one discipline after another that stops, starts dropping into his life. Is affliction always the discipline of God? I don't think so. Not always. Sometimes it's sin, corruption, right? It's, it's just the disease of what this broken earth and broken world is, is bringing. But when God does send discipline, He will send you exactly what you need to flourish. 
So what encouragement does this story give you for your circumstance? Here in the book of Ruth, we see a perspective that Naomi and Ruth don't have. They don't have God's perspective, but we do. We get to step back and read the story, and we get to see the way God sees it. This is, that's their normal experience was to not know where God was at work. Our normal experience is to see where God is at work, and we are allowed to view the story from His perspective with the outcome of the story being certain. What's hard for us is we don't know if the outcome of our story is going to be certain. Sometimes we gasp and sigh at the highs and the lows and the ups and the downs of the story, but we certainly know where it's going. We know how the story is going to end. We know that God is in control. We cannot often view our lives from the perspective of God's sovereignty, but we get to see it here in the book of Ruth. And we may have empty bitterness that has brought us hurting hearts, but we can see and remember that God Himself, His hidden hand, is at work in your life. And if He sends you His discipline, He will also always send you everything that you need to flourish because He clings tightly to to His people and His covenant promises never fail. How do we know that God has met all of our needs? I mean, there's a primary example that we have and it's called the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus, that He met our needs to be reconciled, to be brought back into friendship, and He's done it through the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and we celebrate that every month. Nearby you, you've got a um, communion, little communion pack, if you wouldn't mind grabbing a hold of that. And I invite you, if you have transferred your trust from your work to Jesus' work to save you, if you have received this, this Jesus and you've believed that His work counts in your place, if you have a sense of God's has regenerated you, then we invite you to join us. And if not, we want you to wait until that time in your life where you do have faith, where you have transferred your trust from, from yourself to Jesus. So you don't have to belong to our church. You don't have to belong to a certain denomination. If you belong to Jesus, join in with us. And then pray for a miracle that you're able to get that little plastic off the top. There's little miracles happening every communion Sunday in here. Now, we got you those so that they were a little bit easier, a little bit more, uh, um, a little bit more, um, I don't know if the word sanitary, but I've often thought to myself, these are really, really nice because they're spill proof. And then you try to take the cap off and spill it all over. I'm not quite sure we're hitting the target here, but. Again, these are symbols. These are elements. These are... uh, um, So, let's do this. Um, Would you separate those pieces? We're going to start to sing together here, and then I'm going to come up and lead you in communion. We're going to pray and sing, sing and pray. We'll do the singing. You do the praying and the singing. And then I'm going to come up and lead us in communion, and then we're going to pray together, okay? Okay. Let's sing and pray.